We will start in at verse 1. We're going to read the first 13 verses to kick it off. Kick it off. See what I did there? That was a foot. Okay, good. <laughs> Whose rules are running the show? Mark 7, 1 to 13. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, and some saw his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is korban, that is, a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down, and you do many such things like that. Okay, so there's a few things we want to uh, unpack and make sure that we understand in here. The first thing, verses 1 through 5, the Pharisees see that the disciples are not following the tradition. Now we, in the 21st century, knowing what we know about germ theory, think, well, yeah, we kind of want people to wash their hands. That's a good thing. This isn't just about washing. This is about ceremonial cleansing. The Pharisees had a certain way that they would roll up their sleeves and they would hold up their hands like this and someone would pour water over the tips of their fingers and then they would turn their hands the other way and then they would pour water the other way around. They'd give them a couple of shakes, and I mean, they had a specific ceremony for washing their hands. And if you didn't do the ceremony the way they did it, and then they would have said, well, if you didn't do it the way that we say you have to do it, then it doesn't count. So they are focusing on their own tradition. And scripture warns us about elevating a specific tradition above God's word. That's what this whole passage is about. Now, there are some traditions that are fine. There are some things that we just tend to do that might be elevated above everyday activity, but still makes them important. We wouldn't say they are equal with the word of God. But for example, I learned shortly after arriving here that we are not going to move that organ out in the foyer. That stays there because that's a tradition. Now, it's not that that's like equal with the word of God, but I understand that's been the organ that the church has had for ages. Um, there's a lot of memories associated with that. Personally, I think it's neat that it's a pump organ that doesn't require electricity and it still works. And I totally get not getting rid of a musical instrument that technically still works. So there are certain traditions that are fine, valuable to have. It's when those things get elevated above the word of God that now it becomes a problem. <clears throat> Verses 9 through 13, there's something we should probably explain when we talk about uh, the, the word korban. That's a, an odd little word. <coughs> it's only found here in scripture specifically. Jesus is saying, look, the Ten Commandments specifically say, honor your father and mother. That means... Take care of them when they're older. That's what their understanding was. And so, it's expected that children will care for their parents. But there was this thing that evolved uh, around this particular time 
the people who were uh, Pharisees, who tried to be incredibly spiritual, wanted to make sure that they could say that they had set aside money for the work of the temple. And that, anything that was set aside for that, they would call a, a temple gift. And so they would just pronounce the word Korban. This is Korban. That means that this is set aside. We only use this for temple stuff. Now, is there anything particularly wrong with that? No, not necessarily. How many of you have more than one set of dishes in your home? And that one set of, there's one set of, oh, this is for company, we only do that, right? Any nice china? We have those. I, I have a, a number of very special um, coffee cups. Now they get regularly used, but there's one that my, my daughter picked out which is probably twice the size of any normal coffee cup. <laughs> that's dad's coffee cup, and that's what it's, it's heavily used. It's got chips and cracks in it, but as long as it still holds coffee, I'm going to drink out of that coffee cup. That's my coffee cup. It's special to me. It's Corban. It's set aside. And Corban is not just set aside for any use. It's for temple use. So what would happen is these um, ultra-religious people realized that they probably should be setting aside money to care for mom and dad, but they would say, this is all Corban. This is all set aside for the temple's use. Notice that they haven't given it to the temple yet. They get to keep it until it's time to give it to the temple. But because they pronounced this as a gift, this is, this is set aside for God, that means it can't be used for anybody else. And Jesus says, if they take their tradition and they elevate it over their responsibility to care for their parents, which is specifically outlined in the word as a commandment, then their priorities are screwed up. So what we need to do, whose rules running the show to find that out, we have to calculate the weight of our own rules. We have to calculate the weight of our own rules. Everybody has their own set of rules for living. That's okay. Some of them are intentionally created out of a response to an experience. Some of them are unexamined learned behaviors that you just picked up from growing up. Some of them change over time as we use them. But everybody's got a set of rules, and that's fine. But how do you determine the weight of your own set of rules? Okay. I know, for example, that I'm supposed to go to church because it's good for me and do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's in the New Testament. Except when the Seahawks are playing at 10 and 15 in the morning on a Sunday. Because, you know, you have to keep the things that you're really devoted to close to your heart. And how do you weigh? <clears throat> Well, you get a DVR, really. <laughs> and you tape the game, and as you walk into the church building, you say, God love you. I'm glad to be here with God's people. Don't tell me the score. Don't, I, I will watch it after church. I'll go in. I'll have coffee. I'll have two cookies. And then I will bug out as quickly as I possibly can and go watch the game and forward through all the commercials. If that's your system, that's fine. But just weigh. Calculate the weight of your own rules. <coughs> And if that were all, that would be fine, but there's more to it. Let's pick up the text at verse 14 and go through verse 23. <laughs> Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He said, don't you see that nothing enters a man from the outside that makes him unclean? It doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of the body. And in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, all of these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. 
So when we're trying to figure out whose rules are running the show, we not only need to, to, to calculate the weight of our own rules, but we've got to clarify the why of God's rules. Clarify the why of God's rules. Now, it is my personal belief, Scripture doesn't specifically say this, but it helps me frame this, that all of the commands, all of the laws that God gives aren't because God just wants to entertain himself by making us run around and do stuff. Not at all. Everything that's in Scripture is a reflection of God's character. God says, don't lie because he is truth. God says, don't murder because he is life. God says, don't commit adultery. Don't be faithless to your partner because he is faithfulness. Does that make sense? So all of the rules in Scripture are based out of God's character, based out of who he is. And in the same way that I have been telling you for years that we, as God's people, minister out of who we are, so does God. God ministers to us out of who he is. We see his character reflected in the law. <clears throat> so understanding why the law is the way it is is incredibly beneficial for us. I'm not saying that we as Christians need to follow the law. Jesus himself said that the law is completed. It is finished. It's fulfilled. But knowing it gives us insight into the creator. It was once said of a well-known architect that God is in the details. The law is like that. As we examine it, as we learn it and study it, we're not bound by anything to follow it because the law has been completed, but we get to know the law writer by seeing what he's given. So that's kind of the clarification of, of what Jesus is doing here in verses 14 and 15. He's, he's clarifying what kosher really means. It's not about making yourself more godly by controlling what you eat and what you don't eat. He says the, the, the actual substance of what you eat doesn't matter to God. He declares all things clean here in verse 19. But the important thing is why that is being said. Uh, a little aside here. If you'll notice uh, in our um, NIV text that the Pew Bible has, Look at verse 16. What's it say? Can't find it, can you? There's no verse 16 in here. This is one of those um, uh, areas where there's a little uh, difference in translations. And so since the text that's found in verse 16 isn't found in the, the 10 most uh, populous and used translations, it stepped out. For those of you who are curious, it's for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. That's what's found in some of the, in a large collection of minor manuscripts, minor meaning there's not as many copies of them, but there are a lot of various copies of them. It just happens to do with, with how we recognize the, the word of God to have been compiled. So don't worry, oh my gosh, verse 16 is missing. No, it's not. For you who have ears to hear, let them hear. You can pick that up from uh, King James. There are lots of Bibles that have that in there, but the point of this is that we pay close attention to what's in Scripture. Verses 17 to 19 help us understand that what we eat doesn't spiritually degrade us. You know, I thought you were Christian, and then I saw you eating Funyuns, and I just have a hard time with that. And the Funyuns aren't the worst thing. It's those chicharronis things. That's, you know, that's, that's made of pig, y'all. There are some people who have a real problem, but you can't eat anything that oinks. You just can't. I just refuse to eat anything with a face. I, I just no face eating. Um, I really kind of disagree with that on, on moral grounds. I'm not going to go out and chow down on head cheese, but that's for a whole different reason, okay? <laughs> Jesus is saying that the content of the law has a reason for being there. 
And in verses 20 through 23, he reminds us that this law, like so much of the law, is all about what's inside the person. It's what inside that counts. And he gives the list. This is what makes a person evil. I have to admit, when I see this idea show up in the text about what's inside us that counts, it, it, it makes me automatically go back to those credit card commercials that constantly ask what's in your wallet. And I'm by no means the only minister who's done this. If you go on YouTube and look up what's in your wallet, there are lots and lots of sermons posted on YouTube that what's in your wallet is the same thing as asking what's in your heart. So I kind of, I, I get that. That correlation is easy to make. But it's not just about examining what's in our hearts. It's being careful to examine how we weigh what's in our hearts versus what's in God's word. And I know, I know it is difficult when you have a particular pet belief that you find isn't supported in scripture to say, I need to bring this pet belief down a few notches or even more difficult, I need to let that go. I need to, to decide I don't believe that anymore. That's hard. I know that's hard. Let me share something with you that might help you figure this out. This is from the Savoy Declaration of the, or the Westminster Confession. <coughs> let me read you this quote. Our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority of the word of God is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. We recognize that the word is true by the work that the Holy Spirit does with it in our hearts. Now, I'm going to ask you to fasten your seatbelts for a little bit. This very phrase is one of the reasons why the Catholic Church, as an example, says that Protestants don't get it. Because the Catholic Church interprets this as saying, well, everybody, that just means that you have your own beliefs about stuff. And if you're just trying to interpret it, and that means that your own individual interpretation is above the Word of God, because you use it to figure out what God's Word is. To which I say, they've missed the point. Here is the point. And here we are in a congregational church. The you here isn't you, the individual. I do not expect each one of you to open a Bible and go, Judas hung himself. Well, that's not good. Go thou and do likewise. Okay, now I'm really in trouble. I'm not expecting you to do that. Because we, as the body of Christ, the gathered body, interpret Scripture together. So when, when I'm preaching and you're taking notes and we're all working on this stuff, uh, after this time when we go into fellowship and we're, we're talking about it, before this time when we're in Sunday school and we're opening the Word and we're going through line by line, verse by verse, and we're kind of hammering out how does this work among us, that is the Holy Spirit at work in us. It is a group thing, not just as individuals. The collective understanding, congregationalism. Now, let me wrap up with this thought. I'm not saying that our own individual choices should be ignored. Everybody's individual choices are fine. Now, I might prefer sci-fi over westerns, but that's not a definition of capital T truth. <coughs> Full disclosure, there are some pretty awesome westerns out there. Some people might choose mac and cheese over Chinese food, but that's not an indicator of eternal truth, no matter what Kraft Foods might say to the contrary. <laughs> you see, Jesus challenges his followers to choose God's rules above their own. This is our opportunity to show that Jesus' challenge has taken root in our lives. We, together, as God's people, choose to live our lives by God's agenda, not just our own. Let's pray. <clears throat> so Lord, here we are. We see your challenge to 
the Pharisees, to the, to the very religious people in the text. And they're trying their best, these very religious people, to be as close to God as they can, which is why they created all of these traditions in the first place. But somewhere, adherence to these traditions has gone awry. Something's gone wrong. And they've taken the traditions and elevated them above God's actual word to us. And so, Lord, we know that this tendency is a human thing. We could do this. We could be the kind of people that, that Jesus would say, all right, you guys are hypocrites, and you're honoring me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And, Lord, we don't want our hearts to be far from you. So we're asking you this morning, and every morning, actually, that you'd show us where our hearts might be going astray and that you'd provide the corrective from the word to bring us back to the center of your will. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.